Good morning, Christ Memorial Church. It is so good to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship. My name is Steve Martin. I'm the Director of Worship Arts, and we are just so glad to have you. So whether you are in this space, whether you're worshiping with us online, whether you're in the gathering place, welcome. You are in a place to worship our Lord and Savior today, and that is our story, to worship and praise God. So. We have a few announcements to start our worship this morning. One is our Rock the Block, which we've been talking about for a little while. We are accepting school supply donations and monetary donations. So stop by Kiosk One after the service this morning and pick up either a supply list or a donation envelope or both. And if you can return those donations by August 7th, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we also have been putting together Family Faith to Go toolkits. Um, these are buckets uh, for the summer that contain a Bible teaching about being a good neighbor, um, as well as beach supplies and fun things like that. So these are meant to reinforce the story of God's words, as well as action steps for being a good neighbor. So the goal here is if you take a bucket for your family, take a second bucket to give to a neighbor, okay? So take one for yourself and take another, take a deep breath, Brace yourself, use the strength of God, and go to someone and give them the gift of this family faith to go bucket, okay? The last is that we are having another walk-in choir event. You don't have to come to a rehearsal outside of Sunday morning. Simply show up next Sunday, July 24th, at 8.15 a.m. We will have music for you. We will have people to show you where to go. This is your opportunity, if you've thought about singing in choir ever, to show up and sing with us in worship. Those are our announcements this morning. Um, let's join together in a call to worship. The God who challenges us is also the God who encourages us. The God who confronts us is also the God who accepts us. Be assured that God is with us, even now, accepting, guiding, and forgiving. Thanks be to God. We will do what we can for our neighbor's good and work faithfully so that we may share with the poor. The truth with our neighbor in love. Render judgments that are true and make for peace and not devise in our hearts any evil against anyone. We will be content whatever the circumstances through the strength of Christ within us. For the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Will you now stand with me and let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to go to God in prayer in just a moment here, but before we do, I have a few announcements for you. Uh, first, as a church, we want to extend our sympathy as a church family to Joan Bosch in the, past, the recent passing of her son-in-law, Al. We also want to extend our sympathy as a congregation to Terry Dienick, in the recent passing of her husband, uh, her husband Ron, and then also to Janet Skenzel Davis in the recent passing of her husband Chuck. As we just sang, we know the hope that we have, but these are still such tender moments. And so just remember to keep these, each of these families in your prayers this week. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning in worship, grateful for another day that we get to spend together as your church family, grateful for another time we have to, to sing your praises, to, to hear your word proclaimed, and, and just like we're doing this very moment, Lord, to be able to come and talk to you. Uh, just the fact that you are the God who controls this entire universe. You, you hold the sun, moon, and stars in your hand. Lord, you have so many things that you attend to every second of the day, and yet you still take time to patiently bend your ear and listen to us as your sons and daughters, to hear what's on our hearts and on our minds. Lord, we are just amazed by your deep love and care for us. Today we affirm that you are the God who, who brings order out of chaos. You're the God who, who took the chaos of the creation and you spoke into it and you brought about this life that we now get to enjoy. And you're also the God who calms our restless hearts. Lord, thank you for the way you continue to work in each and every one of our lives. This, this morning as we come before you, we just confess the ways that we still think about our lives and find ourselves worried and anxious. The times that, like Peter, we, we take our eyes off of you and then feel ourselves slowly start to sink. We also confess the ways that that even though you have called us to be your people, and even though we, we seek to follow you faithfully, Lord, there are times that we get distracted and, and that we lose focus in our weakness. And so forgive us, we pray. And having forgiven us, Lord, we just want to give you thanks for the way that, that even in our weakness, you shine your strength and your power right through us, right through the middle of our own shortcomings. Lord, thank you for giving us this time to come and refocus and recenter our hearts on you. Thank you that we have this hope that as we just sang, indeed in Christ alone, that's where our hope is found, not in how well we live this life, but in how well Jesus lived it for us. Lord, the gift you have given us is beyond amazing and incredible. And so, so we just pray that our prayer this morning, we just ask that you would help us to always keep our eyes fixed firmly on Jesus. Lord, in this world, we lifted up the, the different ways that we see sin's effects still happening. And we confess we know that this world needs you. And so help us to be the great neighbors you have called us to be. Help us to be constantly pointing others to the one true hope, the one true solution to everything that's broken. And not just to our friends and neighbors, not just to this world, but even, 
in our families, Lord, for those that we love that do not know Jesus or maybe those that, that seem to have walked away from him. We just ask as your people that you would fill us with your spirit. Give us the words we need to speak. Give us the hearts and hands to be living Jesus' love daily to everyone you've called us to and everyone that you have placed in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for this time of worship and we lift it up before you. As we sang a few moments ago, Lord, be our vision. Be our vision as we hear your word proclaimed. Open your servant's mouth to to teach us what you would have us know and open our hearts and our ears to accept your word and to follow it faithfully. We pray all this in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. During that prayer, of course, I'm convicted of my own sin and my own weaknesses, and then how I not only am aware of them, but oftentimes will knowingly choose to give in to them. And I am grateful that we are going to be singing about yielding our allegiance to God and knowing that that is the true pathway of blessing. So could you stand with me and sing the truth that comes in living for Jesus?
It was great. I remember my mom played the clarinet when she was growing up, and so when I was, uh, I don't know, at some age, she took that out and gave it to us kids, and we tried playing with the reed in there, and it did not work. There was a lot of squeaking and squawking, and I'm pretty sure at some point she thought we were going to break it, so but it was a beautiful thing. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. It's good to be back. This is our fourth week in our series that we're talking about good neighboring. Now, it being the fourth week, that means there's, well, there's good news and there's bad news. 
Now, we'll take the bad news first. We'll take our medicine. But the bad news is simply this, that the average person, statistically speaking, breaks their New Year's resolution within 32 days, somewhere in the first month, essentially. And so I say that because if you sort of partnered with us and you sort of said, okay, this is a good neighboring thing. This is what my church is doing. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be doing. I started walking my neighborhood. Maybe I opened myself up to the art of receiving. I borrowed a cup of sugar even though I didn't need it. You know, whatever it might be, you know, he started doing those things. Well, a fair warning right about now or sometime in this coming week is when you're going to say, you know what, maybe I'm not seeing results from this. Maybe I'm not seeing any fruit. Let's just bag it, right? And we're going to skip it. So that's, that's the bad news. However, there's good news that goes along with that as well. Other studies have found that it takes roughly 21 days for a new habit to feel comfortable, right? Now, it takes longer than that. It takes about two months or so, or it can even take longer than that for it to begin to feel automatic, but it does actually happen, all right? The Navy Navy SEALs train themselves to make their bed first thing in the morning. I'm sure you've heard this because they do it right at the first thing so they get a win each and every day right off the bat. That sets them up for the rest of the days uh, to accomplish even more wins. So the task that we have before us today then is to sort of make it over that hump. It's crunch time where people are either going to give this up or we're going to endeavor to make it a real habit that uh, becomes a regular rhythm and routine of our life. And so this week we want to talk about the art of focusing. All right, sort of realigning ourselves or recommitting ourselves to what it looks like because all over the place in our lives, we are filled with opportunities for distraction. Studies have shown that the average person picks up their cell phone 1,200 times a day. The average business person checks their email 30 times an hour which means they do it like once every two. In fact, studies have shown that what this has done, according to research, our attention span has decreased fairly significantly over just a 15-year period. In the year 2000, our attention span was 12 seconds. In the year 2015, it was down to 8.25 seconds. Can you imagine if I had to put a new slide up every 8.25 seconds? We'd never get done. But here's the sort of coming home. Scientists now reckon that we have a shorter attention span than goldfish. <laughs> so we've got a little work to do, right? Like we've got to, we've got to turn this tide. Everything in, in culture is going to be working against us, but that's kind of our wake-up call, all right? And so there's good news, though. Like leaders, I mean, there, are, there are, are focuses on foci everywhere, and some of the greatest leaders we have in our world today talk about this an awful lot. John Maxwell says, what you focus on expands, and what you don't focus on shrinks. So if you, if you for instance, uh, financially, if you focus on where each and every dollar goes each and every month and you endeavor to save, if you focus on that, I virtually guarantee your savings is going to expand. But if you don't, if you just do whatever you want, never balance your checkbook, never look at your bank account, more than likely your savings is going to shrink right? Now, the same is true of something like worry or anxiety or fear. If you focus on those things, they are going to expand. But if you don't focus on them, they will tend to shrink. And so as we endeavor to talk about this today, we want to look at a couple different areas of focus from the scriptures and then eventually from the life of Jesus as well. But I want to open with a couple scriptures because I want you to have these to sort of ground yourself as you go into this week and as you go into coming weeks to understand where these two ideas of focus come in in the scriptures. The first one, they're both pretty common stories, right? The first one comes to us from Exodus chapter 3. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Moses is busy. He's, you know, shepherding sheep and goats and things of that nature. He brings them out. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Now Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Now you've probably heard this before, but I just use this as sort of an anchor or a grounding point. The fascinating thing about the story or the interesting thing, the strange thing that Moses goes to investigate is not not the fact that a bush is on fire in the wilderness. We actually learned in Israel that that can be a fairly common thing. The wilderness of Israel is incredibly dry. It's rocky. It's not sandy. And so the hooves of animals could very easily kick up against a rock, a piece of flint, and set a bush on fire. No big deal. But the interesting thing was that Moses, this is what the rabbis say, was that Moses paid attention long enough 
to see that though the bush was on fire, it wasn't burning up. Okay, so this is one of them, just, to, just the reality of like, do we take long enough to decide to like to focus on one particular thing? That's one aspect of focus. Do we take the time to notice what's happening or do we just go all over the place? So that's one aspect. Now there's the second aspect of focus that'll come from another scripture passage. This one also fairly familiar. Second Kings chapter six says this. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Aram, the enemy of Israel at this point. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. So Elisha is a prophet of God. This is one of his servants. And then he said, don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than there are on theirs, or those for us are more than those against us in other translations. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. And so when I talk about focus, there's an aspect where it's like less distraction, focus on one thing long enough to see what actually is happening. There may be what God is actually doing there. But then there's the second aspect of focus where we need to invite God into our lives to open our eyes, which are actually like our organs of focus, right? To open our eyes to see beyond the reality that's normally set before us, to see God's sort of perspective on the situation as opposed to our own human perspective on the situation because we will often focus on the fear or the anxiety or the dread or the bad news or something like that and we need to ask God to help us to see the situations now from God's perspective and not merely from our human perspective does that make sense okay cool three people shook their heads they got it three people are on board with me so now now we want to see how Jesus does this because again, and I know I've said this over and over, but I'm just gonna keep hammering on this thing. The scriptures tell us that the most important command is love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says that all the law and the prophets hang on this one command, love your neighbor as yourself, which means this ultimately is intended to be the highest priority of our lives absolutely the highest priority everything should be shifting somehow into this direction it's not as though we can put love god at number one and get to our neighbors whenever we feel like it it's as though they're one and the same and so if in fact this is true then we would see this as well in jesus life and all of jesus's ministry would be directing people toward the love of god and love of others now we know of course that if anybody loved the entire world if, anybody, if to anybody the entire world was their neighbors, that was Jesus. But how then does he sort of focus or help bring about this, this salvation for everybody? So we have Mark chapter 3, looking at verse 13 through 19. I'm going to mess with these tech people. I'm really, really sorry. I'm going to go before that. So I'm sorry, Dave, in the booth. I should have told you about this before. But if you would, if you've got a Bible or something, I'm going to turn back a couple verses and we're going to look at Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 7, before we get here. But while we're here, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. Anyway, while we're here, notice that this is the part where Jesus appoints 12 people to be apostles, right? That's in verse 13, 14, 15, stuff like that. We're going to go back before that. And so just hear these words. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Now, wait a minute. He withdrew with his disciples he hasn't even chosen his disciples yet. So apparently there's a larger group that's identified as disciples. Does that make sense? He's withdrawing with his disciples, but it's not even going to be for six verses until he tells us that he's chosen them. So that's one aspect. And a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. 
because of the crowd, he told his disciples, again, who are these people? There's, there's more than the 12, to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. Now notice, Jesus is doing these things. We're gonna read in a minute. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. And so people are, all kinds of people, it's like he's winning the game. He's creating a mega church. All kinds of people are coming to him. And yet Jesus's perspective is always kind of to pull back right, to pull back from the crowds. Now, I mean, there are practical reasons for that, of course, but we always see him pulling back just a little bit. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him, and whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. So what is drawing this crowd, these, these crowds to Jesus? He's teaching people, he's healing people, and he's driving out demons. And so they all want to come around Jesus. All right? So now let's look at what he does next. He continues to retreat. And in Mark 3.13, it says this, Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them. Now let's stop there a minute. If he appointed 12 of them, how many were there? Probably more than 12. Does that make sense? Right? Like, I mean, that's, that's the point. But like, so Jesus, in some sense, he's inviting all of these people to him. He's inviting the ones that he sees as disciples who are dedicated to him. On a, on a quick side note, this is likely where he invited them. The picture all the way to the right is uh, Mount Arbel. The picture in the middle is us hiking up Mount Arbel. The picture on the left is us on top of Mount Arbel. The picture or the arrow there is pointing to the Sea of Galilee. This is very likely the mountain near the Sea of Galilee that Jesus would have gone up on to pray and to call the disciples to him. It's not the easiest hike up there. In fact, if <laughs> Tracy probably won't go there again. She's done it twice now. But this is probably where Jesus was. So he calls people up to meet him. And then out of that crowd of people, he selects a smaller group of people, 12 of them who he chose to be apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to identify them. But I just want to show you one other place that this says this. This is a parallel passage in Luke. One of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray. So Luke takes what Mark said, but then he expands on it. It's not just that Jesus went to the mountainside and called those with him. In fact, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called, the disciples, called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. So again, there's more, but he chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. And so what we see in Jesus is Jesus, of course, loves everybody. Everybody's coming to him, but he continues to draw back with the purpose of focusing on a certain number focusing on a smaller number that he first invites, then he includes, or sorry, he invites them, then he identifies who they are, and then he invests in them. So what does it say he's doing back here? They sent them out to preach and gave them authority to cast out demons. In other words, he is now creating sort of disciples or duplicates of himself, and this is how Jesus' focus works. It goes from the large to the few because he knows his focus on a few is going to multiply to the many. All right? Now, that's the one aspect of focus, right? It's narrowing the focus to one individual. Now, I want to show you what happens when he invites God, and Jesus is God, but he invites God into this process of focusing because I would suggest that the group that he brings together, these 12 he designates apostles, is the weirdest group ever to be brought together on the face of the earth. All right, because if you said, Dave, uh, I want you to form a group of people who you're gonna train to be like you and, and preach or lead or whatever it might be, more than likely I would go out into this world and find an awful lot of people who were just like me who basically had the same beliefs as me, the same values as me, maybe the same political leanings as me, um, whatever, all of these things, I would probably go out and try and find as many people as I possibly could who were almost just like me. But look at what happens when Jesus spends the night praying to God and invites God into this process. These are the 12 he chose. Simon, whom he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. 
Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, who is also called Nathaniel in other Gospels, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. Now, let's just, I know some of you have probably done this before, but if you haven't before, let's just take a look at this group of people who are now following Jesus. And let's see if we can pick out some things that we know about them. Well, Simon, who is also known as Peter, if you read through the Gospels, Simon is always the one who speaks up without thinking, right? Oftentimes putting his foot in his mouth. How many of you have ever been in a group where someone spoke up without thinking? How many of you wanted to go to the group again if that person was going to be there? Would you not call and be like, is Peter going to be there? Oh, I have a doctor's appointment or, or something like that, right? Like, so that's not the first person you choose maybe to be in a group that you're leading, but he, he picks them anyway. Then, of course, we probably know that Peter and Andrew and James and John are fishermen, right? And Matthew, we know, is a tax collector. And you all probably know this, but in that day, a tax collector would tell Rome, hey, Rome, if you make me tax collector over this area, I will collect X amount of dollars, you know, in taxes for you. And they're like, oh, that sounds great. And so then you would go out and you would collect that money from from the common people and you would collect a little more to make a living for yourself. And it was said that tax collectors would go right to the seashore and they would be waiting for the fishermen when they came back. So how is this going to go when he's got a group of four fishermen and then Matthew in this group? Are they best buddies? No, probably not. And then if you just keep going through, you find out that like Thomas is somebody who doubts later on. And so he's, pers he's probably like the person who always plays devil advocate in the group. And so they're always like, well, yeah, I know it says that, but this, that, and the other thing. You've got this guy Thaddeus, who's also Nathaniel, who when Jesus finds him, it's the middle of the day and he's just sitting under a tree. So I don't know if he's like a poet or a philosopher or just lazy, but it's something like that. And then just right down there later is Simon, who's known as the zealot. Now, zealots are people who are so passionate about their beliefs that they are willing to kill for them, right? So, I mean, I don't care if it's far right or far left, but they are so passionate about their belief, they are willing to kill for them. Now, how well would that person do with a guy who, like, spends his days sitting under a tree, like, singing songs, reading poems, like, hey, no, like, they wouldn't get along. They would, like, come on, Nathaniel, we've got to do something about this. And he's like, well, you know, I heard this great song one time that, like, they're not going to get, this is the weirdest group that has ever been put together. And then, of course, Judas, who ultimately is going to betray Jesus, so he's not really even in on the whole thing. And yet, the strangest group brought together, I, I'm pretty certain, by God's spirit, right? Somehow, they ultimately go out and quite literally transform the world. You can read about where all of these disciples, save Judas, went after Jesus died and was resurrected. And they went all over the kingdom and all over the world sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, the question would be, how did they do this? And I would say this. It's because they had Jesus always in front of them as their single solitary focus. And Jesus' single solitary focus throughout all of the Gospels, throughout all of his life, was hold, held together by two commands, love God and love your neighbor. And so Jesus went around showing them what it looked like to love God by loving their neighbor, even those who they thought were their enemies. I believe that it is ultimately their focus on Jesus that made them into these transformative disciples that went out into the rest of the world. Now, there's actually, there's actually one more step even beyond this that I call inclusion. And so later in Mark's gospel, right, we've gone from the great crowds to a certain group of disciples, we don't really know how many, down to focus on even fewer disciples, which is 12. And then if you go in even further, there are, are times when Jesus goes certain places and he only brings three. Then Jesus stepped or stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And so he stops everybody and then he goes somewhere and he only brings three of them with him. Or later in Mark, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. Now, the way I articulate this, just because I want to make four eyes for us this morning, the last eye then, as I said, he includes them. 
more than anyone else, Jesus includes them in the, the most authentic, most transformational times in his life. And so what we see here in Jesus then is the invitation to each and every one of us as well. If we want to make it over this hump, if it's crunch time, if we want to say, hey, I want to make this love of God and love of neighbor a regular, comfortable, habitual, maybe not comfortable, but a regular, habitual, natural thing for me to do, then I think this is how we press through this week and into the next weeks and into the weeks to come. I believe in it so much that we made these little flyers, these tangible, practical things that you can take with you as as you go, and this is what they have on them, right? Beautifully designed Christ Memorial Church. Thank you, Laura Klein Hexel. And then on the back, it walks us through these four ways that Jesus set about focusing. Number one, it's invite, right? It's invite, first of all, God into this process, and then people into your lives. I'll talk about how to do this in just a second. The second thing then is to identify through that process people of peace. When Jesus sent the disciples out, they were to find people of peace. So some people are like, hey, do you want to hear about Jesus? And they're like, no. I'm like, all right. And they just kept going on. Right? You don't have to fight it. You don't have to bang your head against the wall. This is just the beginning. Right? But identify people of peace who seem to be friendly to you. You don't have to go to the hardest guy in the neighborhood right off the bat. And then next, it's invest. So just look for some creative ways to bless them and to be generous toward them. Jesus sent them out to preach and to, to cast out evil spirits. And then last, but certainly not least, within that group, it's the invitation to include. Now again, don't do this with everybody or your life is gonna be crazy. But, but pray and go through this process of asking God, who do you want me to include in the more intimate or authentic parts of my life. Not everybody, and this is gonna take a little time to build trust, but who am I gonna invite into my life, into my groups, into my recreational activities, maybe, maybe even into my church? But this is the way we narrow the focus. How do we love everybody as our neighbor? We have to start with a smaller group and a few. Now, do we have any procrastinators? Do we have any people who are just lazy? I'm keeping my hand up, right? Maybe you haven't even embarked or maybe you haven't even jumped into this whole thing yet, right? Because it just seems like such a massive project or, or overwhelming. And so it's funny to me, this week I was studying about focus and in the midst of my study on focus while I was reading this website, um, I saw an ad for another article which distracted me from reading about focus and I clicked on it. Which was great because it was the five iPhone apps that I cannot live without. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. I need a new app or something like that. And so I click on it. But the first one is an app called Be Focused. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. Like, you were in this distraction somehow. And so I clicked on it. And I'm like, what is this? And it's the simplest thing. You know what it is? It's a 25-minute timer on your phone. I'm like, What? So I did a little more reading about it, and actually there's something to this. It's something called the Pomodoro Technique. Now, Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato, and what happened was in the 1980s, a student was trying to figure out a better way to study because he didn't want to and a more effective way to do so, and so he found a kitchen timer in the shape of a tomato, and he set it to 25 minutes, and what he would do is he would break all of his tasks down or his studies down into 25-minute intervals, and he would set this for 25 minutes. He would just try and focus for 25 minutes, and then he would take a five-minute break. Then he would set... A second task, 25 minutes, take a five minute break. And you know what? It worked. And the reality is, is our brains are wired to be averse to negative feelings and appreciative towards positive feelings, right? And so if you have a large thing to study for or a large project to prepare for, you're going to look at it in advance and you're like, that's going to take me forever. And you're going to be overwhelmed by negative feelings. But if you break it down into 25-minute segments and at the end of every 25-minute segment, you get this little ding that says you've completed focusing for 25 minutes, you feel better about yourself. And believe it or not, you get more things done. And so this is just kind of the random invitation. Go ahead and download that app. Or I would go, I'm going to go out and try and find a tomato timer 
and I'm gonna break this, I'm gonna break this thing down into 25 minute segments, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna set a 25 minute tomato timer and I'm gonna pray for five minutes and I'm gonna say, God, I am gonna go out into my neighborhood or into my building that I live in or the, the place I work or I'm gonna walk around the school that I go to, whatever it might be, wherever God is calling, and I'm gonna pray, Lord, for, for five minutes. And then for the next 25 minutes, I'm gonna walk around and I'm gonna say, Lord, open my eyes to things that I haven't seen before. Open my eyes to people that I haven't noticed before. Help bring a focus into this time as I walk around, right? And then when I come home, my phone is gonna ding or my tomato timer, and we'll be like, yes, I did it. And then I'll chuck all the emails that I missed and the messages and freak out a little bit. But then I can set the timer again and say, okay, for the next 25 minutes, I'm just gonna sit down and I'm maybe gonna map out my neighborhood and I'm gonna identify those people who waved back. You would think everyone would wave back, right? They don't. But like the people that I said hi to, okay, maybe that's a potential person of peace. And I'm gonna start identifying some of those things and maybe for that 25 minutes, I'm gonna write down, what do I know about that person? Oh, well, they have a dog, so they must be cool. You know, or they're a teacher, or I think they're retired, or they have three children, or, or whatever it might be. You know, I'm gonna write down the things that I know about them. I'm just gonna focus for 25 minutes and then at the end, I'm gonna get a ding and we'll be like, yes, I focused twice today. And then maybe break that. Now you also, you don't have to do this all at one time, right? You could do 25 minutes today, 25 minutes the next day, wait till the next week. But I mean, for 25 minutes, could you for just 25 minutes brainstorm some, some random or maybe some particular intentional ways to bless some of those people on that list? You probably could. You see, you just break this massive project down into small bite-sized steps. And that makes your brain happy. It makes your neighbors happy. It makes God happy. And that's where we're at today. Because I, again, I don't want this to be some sermon series that was like, oh yeah, that was cool. We did that neighboring thing and we decorated the stage all pretty. Like, no, 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 this is, this is it. This is God's plan. This is Jesus' plan, right? He could have done things with everybody and brought huge amphitheaters worth of people together and taught them all the right things, but instead, Jesus' plan for transforming the world was to narrow that large group down who all wanted to follow him into a smaller group and into a smaller group and into an even smaller group that he included in his life in the most intimate and authentic moments, and they went out and absolutely transformed the world. I believe that Jesus wants to do the exact same thing with you and me in whatever environment we are, we're, we're in. And so let's make it through this crunch time. Let's make it over the hump. Let's focus this week. And next week, we're gonna hear about better together. By the by, next week, Dan preaches live in here and Josh preaches live over in Dwell. So we're gonna do something crazy and have two live preachers at the same time. So. Next week, come to one of them and then watch the other one online because it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna conclude the series, but we're not gonna stop neighboring. Sound good? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, there are a lot of things in our life that we focus on without consulting you ahead of time. There are a lot of decisions we make based on our own human wisdom and human strength, and we neglect the promptings of your Holy Spirit. And so as Steve and as Mike have talked about this morning through worship and through prayer, we too wanna to confess those times when we try and do it on our own, when we think that we know the best way to do it because we see that what Jesus did was he spent an inordinate amount of time in prayer so that he knew exactly what you were saying to him so that he would call the exact people that you were choosing to be a part of his inner circle. Lord, you, are, you have commanded us, you have invited us, you have called us to not only love you, but to, to do so by loving our neighbors. Lord, that is an expansive task that sometimes is just overwhelming to think about. But I believe that you have placed us in particular places, whether it's a job, whether it's a school, whether it's a neighborhood, wherever it might be, you have placed us in particular places with particular people that you want us to, to have influence with through the power of your spirit and in the name of Jesus. And so we pray that you would help open our eyes today like you did for the servant of Elisha. Help us to overcome and not focus on our fears, our anxieties, or our dread, but, but to be able to see what you are doing in the midst of this natural world where your supernatural power is showing up in the midst of our lives and in the communities that we're a part of. May we do this to your glory and in the name of your son Jesus who we pray, amen. The 
Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never. We're swimming in this vast ocean. There's lots of different ways that we can go, and so we need 
the light and the life of God and Jesus before us to do so. So I do want to encourage you. There are these um, uh, corner cards uh, at the back as you exit today. It's just an invitation to write down five people who you're going to bless, who you're going to think about. You don't have to do anything crazy and invite them all into your life in the next 24 hours or anything like that but it gives you people to focus on when you're a little bit distracted, when, it needs, when God needs to bring you home. And then I just wanted to close, if I could today, with just a few more of these great quotes. John Maxwell has got some awesome one-liners, but as you move forward, he says this, put behind you what you can't do and put before you what you can. He says, if you add value to others, they will take care of you. And then last but certainly not least, he says, put behind you the personal benefits and put before you the people benefits. So I think those are great little nuggets of wisdom as we leave. Will you stand to receive the benediction today? May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.